So our presenter today uh, for this presentation is Dona Lee. Dona became a certified Arlington Alexandria uh, Ext Extension Master Gardener in 2017. This is her third year teaching uh, the principles of fall gardening in our urban agriculture series, in person and virtually. Uh, she loves vegetable gardening, especially growing different varieties, trying new techniques, and of course, getting to eat what she grows. And Dona, with that, I'll pass it over to you. All righty. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Julie, in advance for uh, facilitating. So good morning. As you heard, um, I've been a master gardener for um, over five years, but I've been gardening off and on my whole life. Um, I had a kitchen herb garden in the flower bed outside my townhouse for decades, but have really only been consistently growing vegetables for the last uh, 10 years since I discovered uh, the Alexandria City community gardens um, that are nearby. Since becoming certified, I've also expanded my thinking about when and where I can grow vegetables. I no longer limit myself to growing tomatoes and peppers during the summer in a traditional in-ground plot dedicated just to vegetables. I now grow year-round and I'm constantly looking for opportunities to either add a flower to my vegetable garden or sneak a vegetable into the flower bed in our um, townhouse community. My first uh, real foray into fall and uh, winter gardening didn't start actually with growing vegetables. I started with planting cover crops in my community garden to improve the soil. And from there, I tried fall vegetables and then got into uh, winter gardening. Let's look at the uh, topics that I'm gonna be covering today. I'll be sharing my own experiences and lessons learned as I cover these topics. I have lots of those, things that worked um, and things that didn't. I'm gonna pause after each of these topics to take questions and the facilitators will help with that. I also wanna mention that everyone who registered should have received um, an email with links to uh, documents that supplement this presentation. Um, in 90 minutes, um, it's hard to cover uh, everything and I wanted you to have information so that you could um, learn more yourself. Uh, the first document is a PDF that contains all of these slides in, um, in a six uh, slide per page format. The other documents are tools to help you plan your fall and winter garden. Uh, one is a fall gardening vegetable quick reference that I'll talk about um, during the presentation. Another is a fall crop planting calculator. I've uh, set it up for zone 7B, um, but there's also an Excel version of that um, planting calculator. So I can ask Julie to post that in the, um, in the chat so that folks that are outside this zone um, can create a calculator for their own region. It's pretty simple. You just enter in your uh, first frost date, and we'll talk about that a little bit later too. So what do we mean by uh, fall and winter gardening? I'm gonna focus on our own local region. Um, and for folks that are outside the area, I saw that there was somebody from Texas and Florida. Um, you're just gonna adjust a little bit from a timing perspective, but the principles are all the same. So here's a quick summary of how I think about uh, fall and winter gardening. It's, it's planting crops to harvest before and after frost, but it's also planting crops that can overwinter for harvesting uh, early next spring and some even into the summer. It's also about using uh, simple techniques to uh, let us do that and thinking about how we can continue to improve our soil um, over, the, over the winter, um, which is especially important in this area where uh, heavy clay is uh, prevalent. So why do we like to plant in the fall? Well, first of all, the, the soil is perfect. It's already warm, it's soft. Um, hopefully it's workable unless you have this heavy clay soil like us, um, except for the fact that tomatoes and the five pound zucchini season is coming to an end. It has just so many things going for it. The temperatures are moderating, the insects and the weeds um, start to become less of a problem. Um, and it's a chance for us to stop uh, focusing on what for us is that sort of negative, hot, uh, humid weather um, and take advantage of where we live, where we have a very long growing season um, to continue to produce what for us is, is typically organic produce. So succession planting is defined as the practice of seeding crops at intervals of uh, one to three weeks in order to maintain a consistent supply of produce throughout the season. Or it involves planting a new crop after harvesting the first crop where they may not be the same. And that's really what fall gardening is. It's a form of succession planting. And it's a simple tool for um, getting more production out of your space. Um, you simply plant something new in spots uh, vacated by spent plants. Um, putting in cool season crops as the summer uh, crops are finishing up. So let's look at some of the specifics of that. So this is a, is a handy uh, garden planting calendar that was put together by our extension office here in Arlington, Alexandria, and it's for um, hardiness zone 7B. 
Um, now you can, uh, this document was sent out as one of the um, attachments in the email, um, but you can also download another copy at that link there on the slide. So let's extract the information we need that's important to us for uh, fall and winter gardening. Um, based on uh, decades of recorded data, our coldest temperatures are typically five to 10 degrees um, Fahrenheit in the, in the winter. It's, it's, I can't think of the last time that we got down to five to 10 degrees Fahrenheit in our winters. Um, matter of fact, we'd like to have colder weather because it helps kill some of the insects and stuff that, that like to overwinter. But it's important for us to consider because that helps us understand what kinds of things that we can plant and what kinds of protections we might have to provide. So our average uh, last killing frost is uh, early April and our average first killing frost is um, early November. Uh, this last year, I think we ended up not having a frost until I think it was like nine or 10 um, November. So if you look across the top, this chart displays eight months from March to October. And then down the left-hand side is a long list of vegetables that you can grow, and then suggested dates for planting either seeds or transplants, and then harvesting. So if it has a, um, a little asterisk next to it, that indicates that um, you're gonna plant as, as a transplant versus as, um, as seeds. So things like cabbage and then the summer crops like tomatoes and peppers are typically planted as transplants. So right now our garden is in the, is in the middle with the warm season those tender crops that um, hopefully are producing right now, tomatoes, peppers, cukes, zucchini, beans, all of that. And by the way, before we move on, you can see that um, over here, you can actually still be planting um, things like cucumbers and beans and summer squash if you plant them about now, you can get a second crop of those. But now let's look at the fall focus. So in the fall, there are more than a, a dozen different vegetables that you can, um, plant for fall or winter gardening. They range from the lettuces, the greens, and the spinach that really you might not have thought of as suitable for uh, cold weather to the carrots and radishes, and then to, to things like broccoli, cabbage, and cauliflower. Um, I wanna point out there's a couple um, uh, crops on this list that are best grown from transplants. Those are typically what we call uh, the cold crops. It's the cabbage, the cauliflower, the broccoli, and the Brussels sprouts. Um, because they need enough time because of the, their longer maturity. And we'll talk about those and we'll talk about seeds versus transplants later on. So let's look at um, fall days and the temperatures. So the days are growing shorter. Currently we're up here in, in Virginia, we're getting about 14 uh, hours of daylight. It's already 90 minutes less daylight since the summer solstice on June 21st. Fruiting uh, plants like tomatoes, eggplants, um, peppers, squash, cucumbers, they need over uh, six to eight plus hours, and they really are enjoying that 80 to 90 degree uh, temperatures that we're experiencing right now. But as the days grow shorter and the sun's angle starts to be lower in the sky and the light is less intense, we're going to have less sunlight energy for plants. At that point, the conditions become perfect for things like root vegetables, like radishes and carrots. They do well when um, and can do well with just five to six hours of uh, sunlight. Greens such as lettuces, spinach, and Swiss chard, they can take potential sun of just four to five hours. And then many herbs can also tolerate um, less, than, um, less than five or six hours of sun. For some things like lettuce and arugula, it's really the lengthening days in the spring that cause them to bolt more than the temperatures. So it's helpful for them um, as we go into the fall, they'll actually last a little bit longer. Um, Cool nights will slow the plant growth as we get further into the fall. Vegetables will take longer to mature. Um, interestingly, these conditions are actually um, um, uh, good for things like the coal crops. They actually add sugar and improves the taste of things like cauliflower and broccoli. So now let's talk a little bit about um, fall crop uh, selection. First of all, just like I tell people when we teach our, our Vegetable Gardening 101 class, identify what you like to eat. It's helpful to grow what you like to eat or possibly grow something that you'd like to um, experiment with in terms of, you know, can I come up with something that um, I've never grown before or something that maybe will taste fresher coming from the garden or being able to pick it like, just in time to put it on the table. Um, you also have to think about your willingness to invest both time and possibly in additional um, uh, protection, depending on what it is that you decide to uh, uh, grow. I find it takes less time um, to, to garden in the summer and it's easier 
but I still need to watch the weather and keep an eye on the temperatures and, and, and rain to uh, make sure that I'm, things are getting watered or things need to be protected from uh, unexpected heat or, or early frost or, or colder nights. Um, so it's important to identify what you like to eat. Um, it's also important to um, um, learn about the hardiness of the plant variety that um, you're thinking about and also um, days to maturity. So we're gonna start getting into that. So I look at um, the fall crops falling into primarily the three categories of cold crops, greens, and then what I call the root crops. And here are some examples of each. I also put on this chart, the alien family. So that's garlic, onions, shallots, leeks, and chives. Um, because I think garlic is, a, is an overlooked fall crop that's sort of a plant and forget. So if you do nothing else, garlic might be one of those things that you consider, um, consider trying this year, if nothing else. And I, I have a couple of charts on garlic specifically coming up. So now within these categories, there are difference in their, in their cold tolerance. So let's look in, uh, into that. So we have what we call the half hardy, they can survive a light frost. So when we talk about plant hardiness, um, plants are impacted by both frost and freeze. So a light frost occurs when the air is dropped below freezing, so that's 32 degrees, but the ground does not, so that's considered a light frost. A hard frost or freeze occurs when the air is cold and the ground becomes hard. So a light freeze will be somewhere about 29 to 32 degrees, and tender plants like the tomatoes and the peppers, um, uh, basil, are, are often killed if it gets down to that and, and lettuce. A uh, moderate freeze is 25 to 28 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's, it's pretty widely destructive to most vegetation. And then you have a severe freeze, which is 24 degrees and colder, and that provides heavy damage to most plants. So here's a list of plants that are considered half hardy because unlike our tender warm weather crops, they can actually survive a light freeze. So things like the greens on the beach might be a little bit damaged, but it won't kill the plant. Um, Cauliflower, the leaves will be okay um, for a light freeze. Um, it's possible that the flower um, could be damaged and, and some protection might be uh, helpful there. So then let's look at the hardy ones that can survive a heavy freeze. Um, some of these can be grown um, right from seed in the garden while others will do better started indoors and planted as seedlings like all those cold crops that we talked about. And um, we'll give you some more suggestions. And then lastly, the ones that can overwinter and survive a hard freeze. And so we, here we have um, things like arugula, uh, broccoli rob, the charts, kale, um, parsley, garlic, shallots, and spinach. Spinach always surprises me because in my mind, I put it in the category as lettuce. And I think of lettuce as tender and I think of spinach as tender as well, but actually that's not true. Spinach is, is, is quite hardy. Um, so we'll find out a little bit more about these. Um, some of these you can plant. They'll um, go dormant over the winter, then they'll take off again in the spring. And I've had some um, continue all the way into July. I have kale now that I overwintered that is, um, it's just really finishing up now. So that's been um, a nice, a nice uh, success. So now here's my fall gardening um, vegetable quick reference. And so this was a handout that everyone got. This is just a piece of it cut off so you can sort of see what it looks like. Um, so I took information from uh, Southern Exposure Seed Exchange, and this provides um, data on the, the cold hardiness of a whole list of vegetables. And then I went and looked at a lot of um, different varieties of some of these vegetables and, and have put together a range of, of days to maturity. So for instance, beets, you can find beets that um, can be harvested at 48 days, but then they'll go some all the way up to 55 or even 60. And broccoli, there are some varieties that um, can be harvested in, in 50 days, while others can take 100. And the key thing being that if you go for varieties that have that longer maturity, you may not have enough time to actually um, harvest them um, before you would want to in, in the late fall. So you want to look at, at varieties that are a little bit, um, have a little bit shorter um, maturity. But you can look down the list and it goes all the way from, uh, let's see, arugula uh, down to turnips. Uh, a root vegetable. So that's in your handout for you all to look at. And, and the idea was to have it sort of handy to you as a reference as you're going to be sort of daydreaming and thinking about what you want to select. Um, so let's now go to, so for instance, if you look at seed packets or you, especially, you know, you look at online, 
you can find a, um, a carrot in Appley that's 58 days to maturity, or you could choose this purple 68 that's 75 days, but that's almost you know two weeks or more later. And the question is, you know, if you if you plant this smaller, um, quicker uh, maturing variety, um, you'll probably be more successful um, in the, for a fall a fall crop. So let's talk about um, what impacts um, planting and, and um, growing vegetables in the fall. Look at what you want to grow. You need to start planning when you need to get them into the garden based on the maturity that's predicted for them. So for fall planting, we looked at the predicted first frost date for our area, and that's November 1st through the 10th. So it's an estimate. Uh, like I said, what, last year it was something like the 9th or the 10th, but you can decide and you can sort of uh, gamble. So then we take the days to maturity and we add in the germination time. So here's an example um, for spinach. So the, the spinach packet says seven to 10 days to germination and days for maturity for this particular spinach variety is 35. But now what we have to add in is what's called the short day factor. And so what we find is that because of the, the shorter days and the temperatures dropping, we need to allow a little bit more time to the days to maturity. And they, they typically say 10 to 14 days. And so if you add all that up, that means that the days to plant before first frost so that you actually have um, mature plants is 52 to 59 days. Um, so you're adding another, you're basically you're adding that 10 to 14 days to the short day factor. So that means you would wanna sow your spinach seeds 52 to 59 days before the first frost. So for us in this area, the first frost, let's say it's the, the beginning, November 1st, then counting back the dates to sow would be somewhere in September two to nine. This isn't a hard over um, range of dates because you're gonna be harvesting um, the, the spinach after that. And as we've said, spinach is actually hardy down to 10 degrees, but you wanna get it going. You wanna have um, strong roots um, and you wanna have a, a, a healthy plant going so that it can then survive as the temperatures come in much colder and we start to get some possibilities of frost. So that's, that's how it works. But in order to, um, make it easy for you all. I've also provided a planning calculator and this comes from Johnny's Seed. And so Johnny's Seed has taken this idea of the, um, the short day factor and they've taken into account um, typical um, germination rates and applied the formula for um, a whole um, list of, of crops. And I provided this to everybody again, this is just an extract. I just cut it off to show on the screen here so you get the idea. Um, and what you do is, um, I, I use their Excel file and I put in the date of 11.5. So it's right in the middle of our expected November 1 through 10 um, expected frost. And then what it does is it, it calculates. And so it just takes that date and it, um, it tells you for all the uh, different varieties of plants um, when they need to go um, into the ground. Then for some of these, they talk about TP is transplant and DS direct seed. Now, in some cases, although they say um, direct seed, you might be able to do transplants to kind of give yourself a leg up, either by growing them yourself or buying them. And I've done that, and I'll show you some examples um, later on as we go. For folks outside the area, um, we can provide this Excel file, and then if you're in a different zone than 7B with a different um, average first frost range, you can go ahead and just plug in where it says 11.5.2022 plug in your um, first frost date for your area, and then it'll just recalculate the when to plant column for you. And you can just print that out. So we've talked about thinking about plants in the three categories plus the allium group and what might you wanna grow. And we've talked about um, understanding hardiness. And we've talked about understanding this idea of, of maturity and how long it takes for something to mature. So the next steps for you are sort of decide on really how much you want to do. Some of you um, attending today may have already be doing winter gardening and you're just wanting to learn a little bit more. Um, some of you have never started and you may want to um, start simply. Um, some folks may, after hearing all this, decide that they're, they're happy with summer gardening for this year and, and they want to wait and maybe next year they'll, they'll try some things and they'll have a little bit more time to plan. But what you'll want to do is Identify those vegetables you think you want to grow. Um, see what varieties that you can find. If you look online, you might still be able to find plenty and, and get some seeds and their corresponding maturities. Um, decide if, if it's a plant that you need to transplant 
or one that you can direct sow or maybe transplant to save yourself some time. And then look at that chart, um, those two charts so that you can figure out what the cold hardiness is and then what the uh, target planting date would be. And then what you wanna think about is what are those areas that you have that are available for planting? Um, and you wanna sort of map out, um, it could be just a small spot. It could be that you have a bed that's available. Um, you'll have to sort of uh, see what you have. And then one of my suggestions is that you group plants with similar requirements together, especially if you think that later you might have to do some planning for special protection. Um, for instance, lettuces and things that are, are gonna be um, more tender or half, or half hardy are best planted together. Or sometimes it might even be height requirements. If, if things like cauliflower and broccoli tend to get taller, so it might be handy to have those together so that if you do need to even just protect them with a sheet or something, and we'll talk about some of that later, it's easier if those kinds of things are, are located together instead of interspersed um, all throughout your garden beds. Now, when we talk about maturity, um, if, if you don't wanna to do too much and you don't wanna be at this too long into the winter, there are what we call some of these 30-day uh, best bets. And so here's some varieties of uh, vegetables that if you look, you can find um, varieties that give you just like 30 days or, or, or kind of like the shortest, like beets, you can even find some that are 35 days. And what they are is kind of a, a small kind of tiny beet, but you can still get beets, um, you know, or bok choy or, or some of that, um, which that's what's in that picture. There is some bok choy, which is really pretty and some, some of the smaller beets. Um, so those are just some things to get you thinking about what you might do if you don't even want to um, spend the, uh, too long into the season um, gardening. So now there's three ways to obtain vegetable plants. And this is really no different than, than the spring and the, and the summer. You can directly sow seed into the garden. Um, you can purchase plants either from a garden center or a big box store or online. And you could grow your own transplants by starting seeds indoors. Um, and it sort of depends on what you're trying to grow. If you have a, a particular variety that you want to grow, um, budget, um, it can be cheaper to do plants, um, growing your own transplants. Sometimes it's, if you're only gonna plant um, three or four, it might be simpler to just buy a, a, small, um, you know, a small four pack at a, at a garden center than investing in um, sort of the equipment for uh, seed starting. Um, typically in the, in the summer uh, or the spring, sometimes we can have um, seedling volunteers that develop, but it doesn't happen as much for, um, for some of the stuff that we're going to plant in the fall. Now, obtaining seed. Typically this time of year, you can still find seed at your local garden shops. Um, you can buy seed from the mail order seed companies. I think some of the pressure on, um, on seeds um, has, has reduced since uh, COVID has sort of eased off. And I think it's, it's easier to find seeds. Um, there might be other gardeners that you could share seeds with. And maybe you've even saved seeds from another year if you've been um, gardening for a while. When you look at the package um, or the seed company website, they'll give you a lot of information. They'll tell you whether you need to start them indoors or direct seed. Um, they'll provide information on seed depth, spacing, base of germination, and what it looks like to germinate its seed. And then they'll give you the typical information about thinning and base of maturity and, the, and what the what the mature crop looks like. They'll talk about disease resistance, but we don't really have to worry about that so much typically in the fall. So that's kind of nice. So these plants typically um, are, can be in our direct sowed. I also have done transplants for lettuce and spinach and collards and kale, just to kind of, um, it makes it easier for me to, to germinate in water and not have to worry about it in the sun so much in the, in the late summer as it's getting hot. Uh, sometimes if you direct sow, you have to really get out to the garden a couple of times. Um, if your garden's in your backyard, that's not too much of a problem. But if your garden is you know, a few miles away or 10 or 15 minutes like mine, sometimes it's just as easy to have it germinating in the house so that I can keep an eye on it. But anyway, these are all um, opportunities to uh, direct sow. Typically, you'll want to start your seeds in early July if you were going to grow coal crops. So you're saying like, here we are at the end of July. So if, if you're wanting to plant some of those this fall, um, you'll, you'll probably need to buy those transplants. And if they're not in the stores already, they will be. And pretty much at the right time that you'll want to plant them. Typically, the garden centers around here always have at least those four of the coal crops available. Um, and they'll typically also have kale and, and lots of lettuces too. Um, so those are things that you can buy. 
you definitely can start transplants though for some of the greens and the kales um, and, and some of the other vegetables like that. So we'll take questions here. Okay, we do have a few questions. Um, right off the bat, uh, I'm going to go ahead and drop a link in the chat. Uh, someone was asking about a jumping worms alert in Chesterfield. Um, so I posted some information on jumping worms from the Cooperative Extension uh, and some instructions on what to do if you um, if you identify jumping worms, you know, in your in your soil. So the first question is, how many weeks out uh, from the first frost do you start to take short day factor into account? What this tells you is when you need to sow. So whatever vegetable it is, or if you go to the to the chart after this, this will tell you like for um, collards, you could put transplants in now um, in about what a week, August 9th, that takes that into account. If you're gonna protect um, plants with any kind of protection, you get two or three weeks and it, it gives you a bunch of information in the notes on this chart about that. If you're going to um, do uh, transplants, like say collard, you would need to actually um, start the transplants three to four weeks before that August 9th date. Okay. Um, There's a few other questions about short day factor. Um, someone asked uh, if you have to change kind of how you calculate short day factor with uh, raised beds versus in ground. Now, short day factor it relates more to the weather. It relates to temperature and the amount of sunlight that we have than it does really to um, temperatures due to the um, raised bed or, or moisture levels due to the raised bed. It's really the fact that the days are getting shorter and the sun isn't as high in the sky. Uh, and we got one in here at the end uh, while we were covering questions, which um, fall winter crops can we intercrop with the summer uh, or should you should this person pull out the summer crops and put fall winter down now? Oh, I can answer that. Um, depends on what you wanna grow. Um, if you have space among your um, summer crops, like say around, say tomato cages or something, you can easily put in some of the fall crops. I mean, even the root crops or um, the lettuces can go in now. The only thing that you'll have to worry about is when you take out those um, summer crops, rather than pulling them out, you'll wanna just cut them off at the soil level so that you don't disturb the other things that you've planted around it because the roots of your um, of your tomatoes and your peppers and some of that typically are, are very deep and spread out. And if you just were to pull the whole plant out, you'll just disturb, totally disturb what you planted around them. But it's perfectly fine to just cut it down at the, at the, at the level. I find one of the hardest things is making that decision to take out some of those summer crops. I, I tend to leave them in as long as I can. And, and sometimes that means I'm not getting my fall stuff in quite as soon as I should. Really anything on the list could go in. Probably not, probably wouldn't be so great for the coal crops. They need a lot more space. They may be a little bit more difficult to um, try to intercrop with uh, tomatoes and peppers and such, but any of the rest I think should be fine. And if you haven't done it already um, or haven't done it in a while, you might consider doing a soil test. It's, it's a kind of a good time at the end of the season so that you know what's going on with your soil. Um, this is assuming you're not using um, containers. I'm assuming that you either have raised beds or you have in-ground beds. So if you haven't done one, they recommend doing it every three years. And that'll give you information about your soil condition, including the nutrients and um, what percent of organic matter you have in your soil. And so that's an opportunity to um, think about maybe do you want to do some cover crop later to kind of help improve your soil or at least know what you need to do in terms of um, what fertilizers that you're going to want to apply as you as you grow uh, your fall and winter stuff. So what you want to do is remove any waste from the from the uh, that you from the summer crops. Um, it's sort of a cleanliness thing. Diseases and insects like to overwinter and some of that plant litter. So you want to clean that up. Uh, remove all the dead stuff. If it's diseased, you want to um, put it in the trash. Otherwise, you could put it in your in your compost um, pile if you have one. And you want to add a layer of your own or commercial compost to replenish all the nutrients um, used by your summer crops, one or two inches of a compost. Um, and then you, you can aerate it gently with a, um, with a garden fork, fork. I'm not a big um, proponent of totally turning over um, soils. You just uncover weed seeds and you um, um, kill some of the, those sort of um, microbial um, connections in the soil. So I like to just sort of work it gently. 
Um, so that's what we'll do to prepare the site. Um, if you're sowing seeds, um, this is not different, very much different than what you do um, in the spring and, and summer. You may want to plant the seeds one and a half to two times deeper than in the spring. Um, you may need to shade the soil or use some kind of white mulch um, boards or newspapers just to keep it cool until some of those seedlings emerge. Because some of them um, can take a long time to germinate at, at some of the high temperatures that we have right now in the soil. Somebody had asked the question, yeah, you can interplant tender greens among the existing plants and actually those plants will provide some shade as, as they actually germinate and start to grow. Um, some people will pre-soak some of the larger seeds for quicker germination. Some people will even pre-sprout seeds and then plant the pre-sprouted um, pre, uh, seeds. You might do it in um, paper towels um, or in, in sort of a sort of a dish uh, covered in a paper towel. Um, I've never tried that. It, it, they just seem too delicate for me um, to handle, but, but you definitely um, can do that and people have success with doing that. One thing I like to do, and if you have children or grandchildren, it's, it's a lot of fun, is I like to make uh, seed tape. And the reason I like to do it is, is it, um, it allows you to sort of make a very specific um, a very specific row. And so if you're planting something that you um, aren't used to planting and don't know what the seeds are gonna look like when they germinate, it's kind of helpful to have them um, come up in sort of this very distinct row. So, you know, it's not a weed, so that's kind of helpful. The other thing is if it's something that needs to be um, thinned out later, like carrots or like radishes, it's kind of nice to just plant them somewhat at the, at the um, distance that's recommended on, on the seed packets versus trying to take tiny seeds. And then next thing you know, you put like 10 seeds in an inch when really you just wanted a couple. So it's just fun and you do it in the cool of your home versus trying to do it in the garden where it's hot. So I just take um, lengths of, of toilet paper. So what you see there um, is about, a, I think four square or six square length. And then I just cut them down the middle on a lengthwise. And then I make this little flour paper uh, mixture, about one tablespoon of each and mix it up. And then I use just a little paintbrush, but you could use a squeeze bottle. And what I do is I go down the length in the center of that um, piece of toilet paper and I make dots every say two inches, maybe if it's radishes. And then I go follow behind and I drop a, a seed in each of those little dots that I made. And then I put some little dots of dabs of um, the flour mixture, which is really like a glue along the edge. And then I just fold it over. So what you have is if you look at the picture at the bottom, you have sort of the seeds sort of to one side and then they're sort of um, sealed shut. And then I just let them dry. And then what you do, which, and it's really easy, is you just make your furrow at whatever depth it, it says on the package, whether it's a half inch or an inch. And you just put that um, strip of toilet paper with the seeds in it down that furrow and you just cover it over with soil and water. And eventually the plants will come up and that, that, that toilet paper will just dissolve and you'll never know that it was there. And so it works out really nicely and it cuts down on the thinning, makes planting pretty quick. Um, if you have kids, they have a good time doing it. And then I just take a, a, a ballpoint pen and I just write on it um, what that strip is. So I, we did a little project with a, a school uh, garden. We had a bunch of different kind of uh, radishes. And so I just wrote with a pen because if you use a marker, it just, it just um, doesn't, it's, you can't write clearly. And then I just, I just store it in a piece of newspaper until I'm ready to use them, just to, to get it from like my house to the garden to plant. But anyway, seed tapes are kind of fun, but not necessary, but fun. Uh, setting out transplants is um, like, the, like the spring and the summer, they need to be hardened off before planting out. And even if you get them from a, a garden center, you may want to um, over time um, expose them to the sun and, and the wind. Once you plant them, they may benefit from some light shading for the first few days. Um, so definitely try to plant them when it's not in the heat of the day, either in the uh, early morning or the late afternoon. Then you want to water lightly and, and frequently to keep them moist. And then um, you'll want to um, make sure that they get you know, one to two inches of water a week. In terms of the seeds that we planted, like either whether we did seed tape or whether we planted them directly in the ground, um, I usually water those every couple of days because they don't need sun at that point. What they just need is moisture in order to get that germination. And so it's good to have sort of a, a steady moisture level in the soil. And um, generally in the garden, the, soil, the surface is what dries first and that's where those seeds are. So I try to spend um, every couple of days um, to go out there, unless, you know, unless it's rained. 
So here's some examples. I have five examples of some things that, that I've grown just to kind of get you thinking about what you can do. Um, I didn't start out using uh, row covers, um, but I've, I've invested in it and um, I use them uh, regularly now, both um, in the spring and in the summer and fall. So in this picture here, the um, left side is the row cover installed in one of my uh, in-ground beds. So you can see in the middle where I've, I've pulled back the row cover so you can see the uh, hoops that are in it. And I'll talk a little bit more about the hoops um, in the next section. So just, just accept the hoops for now and then we'll talk, we'll talk about some of that. Um, but in the um, lower part of the picture in the middle are, is broccoli rob. And in the back part of the picture at the top is, um, is arugula that we planted. So I planted seed um, in that bed. And then this is what came up. And part of why I'm using the um, row cover is partly to protect it from some of the heat of the summer and, and the wind. And um, then partly as, as it gets colder to, to then keep it warm inside because that row cover will help keep it warm. And so those did really well. And the broccoli rob, I was harvesting that in um, I think October, November pretty much. And then the arugula actually kept and overwintered. And so that was really nice. But the broccoli rob, I cut down and it was spent. Now here's an example where we planted um, kale and Swiss chard. Um, and we, so this, in this case, we planted it out uh, with seeds. And so the picture on the, on the left um, is, is pretty much all kale until the, the bottom, um, bottom of the picture is where we put, I think just one row or two rows of Swiss chard. And you can see it a little bit better in the, in the, um, the middle and the, in the right picture. Now in that case, I planted it and never thinned it. And so what we ended up harvesting um, throughout the fall, and then it went into sort of hibernation in the, um, in the dead of winter and then harvested more in the spring was baby kale. Had I um, thinned it, which would have been to at least eight to 12 inches apart, I would have had a lot less plants, but I would have had much bigger leaves. These leaves ended up being um, probably, probably maybe, I don't know, just yay big, like three or four inches. Um, but we got a lot of like baby kale and, and Swiss chard. Um, had, I, had I thinned it, we would have gotten uh, leaves that were more the size of our, the palm of our hand or larger, um, but we chose to do it this way. So that's another example, and that lasts quite a while. Now here's a root vegetable um, bed example. So if we start at the uh, top left, um, under the burlap, um, is carrots. And above the burlap, uncovered, we planted uh, beets. And if you go to the picture um, to the right of that, you can now see where the beets are coming up and also um, some watermelon radishes, um, which is one of my favorite. And I tend to grow watermelon radishes in the fall because they have a 60-day maturity, unlike regular radishes, which have a, like a 23 to a 30-day maturity. And watermelon radishes are, are fantastic and, and they're so big that like one radish is enough for a salad for a couple of days. So that's really nice. So you can see, I still have the burlap down um, because the, the uh, carrots haven't yet started to come up. And the reason I like the burlap is the carrot seeds are really small. And if we get a lot of rain after we plant, they tend to get washed around a little bit. This kind of helps keep it in place a little bit. And I just water through the burlap and it's, it's a, um, kind of a, a loose woven burlap that I found at, um, I think, Home Depot in a roll. So then if you move to the picture on the uh, lower left, at the top, you see the, the um, different, different beets um, and they've really coming along and the beet greens are, are quite larger and, and the radishes next to them. Now you can see that the, the, um, the carrots are, are quite a lot bigger. And these all um, overwintered. Sometimes the greens will get a little bit damaged and they don't look as great. Um, and I didn't cover these. I didn't have any kind of a row cover on these. They were just exposed like this. And then to the, to the right is um, we harvested uh, the carrots in the, in the spring. So we just let those overwinter. And you can see those are kind of a, a six inches, four to six inches kind of length carrot. And they came out really nice. So I said that if you don't grow anything, grow uh, garlic, garlic and shallots. So you can still buy uh, garlic online. There are companies that specialize just in garlic. I, I use Keen Garlic, um, I like it. 
Um, but some of the other stores that sell lots of different kinds of vegetables um, also sell uh, garlic. Or you can just go to an organic grocery store like Mom's we have here in this area and, and make sure that you buy um, organic garlic. What you want is a full sun location. You wanna weed the area well and you wanna amend it with compost and add, add with fertilizer. Now what you do with garlic is you literally take the cloves, you separate them and you plant them pointed end up, root end down, about two inches deep, six inches apart. And so you can plant them six inches in each direction and, and, fill, a, and fill a bed. So right now I've gotten to where I plant maybe 80 cloves, but even if you just buy, um, oh, three or four heads, what you wanna plant are the largest cloves that you can get. And I don't mean elephant garlic, that's a different kind of garlic, but you wanna get some nice size uh, garlic cloves. The, the bigger cloves you start with, uh, the bigger um, heads of garlic you'll get um, next spring. And then what I do is I top dress it with mulch. It helps keep the weeds down and it provides winter protection. Um, I use six inches of straw. It looks like a whole lot. Um, plant it, I put the compost down and then I, um, I cover it with all the straw. You're really not looking to get um, any of the garlic coming of, of the surface. What you're wanting to do and the reason you're planting it deep like that is you're really wanting the roots to develop. Um, I tend to plant mine um, in October, maybe late October. You'll see some people plant them a little bit earlier and they don't cover them with mulch and you'll see lots of greens coming up. Then if we get some frost, that kind of gets um, damaged. And, and I've also heard that if you get too much damage at the top, you'll still get garlic, but you might not get as, as big a head, but that's what you do. It's almost leave it and, and neglect it, but not quite. So here's, here's sort of the progression of my garlic. In this case, I don't know, for some reason, I start at the, um, the upper right and we'll go counterclockwise. So the upper right is the garlic in my bed. Um, we're coming into um, the early winter now. And so you can see that I'm starting to get some growth through that thick straw. And then as you move to the left counterclockwise, you can see where the, the I'm getting quite a lot of um, growth coming out. Basically, each one of those leaves is connected to a uh, clove of garlic. So you're wanting to get, you know, you're hoping to see lots of leaves coming up there. And then as you look in the lower left, um, this is coming into um, the June time frame, uh, May June time frame. And so as the garlic starts to die back, that's when you're going to uh, start thinking about harvesting it. So sometime in late June, um, early July. So here's the thing with garlic: if you make the decision to grow garlic, it's going to take up that bed all the way through. Let's assume the end of the end of June. So you're not going to put anything else in that bed. You're not going to be planting, um, you know, early greens or lettuce or beans or anything. You're gonna you're gonna focus it on garlic, so it's dedicated. So that's something you have to keep in mind. You won't be using that bed for anything until um, early July. Now in early July, you can put things like beans and peppers and, and squash and all in that bed. So you could plan on your succession is to then plant those things in that bed. And that's what we did last year. And so there you see um, my garlic harvested and I pulled it out. And then in the picture to the uh, lower right, you can see where the, where the garlic is um, curing in my, um, in my laundry room, just hanging. So you cut the tops off. Um, there's lots of ways that you can do it. But if you do that, you can keep the garlic um, for actually for months. Um, uh, so what do you do in between? Like in the spring, you're gonna weed, keep it weeded. Um, there's some recommendations for um, fertilizing it a couple times in um, March and uh, April or maybe May. And then, um, and then just water it some, but not too much because you're wanting it to start to dry out a little bit as you're getting into June. So that when you want to actually harvest it on a dry day, so it's not like it's not like so wet that you get a lot of dirt stuck to the, um, stuck to the head. So that's the garlic example. And here's the last example, um, uh, red leaf romaine and watermelon radishes. So I planted these last fall. I bought the, um, the red romaine, uh, I bought red romaine transplants in, um, in September, like September 10th, and I planted those out. And then I planted the um, watermelon radishes, it's like three rows there. And that was where I had had um, some garlic and then I had planted some cucumbers. They didn't do all that well. So when I pulled them out, I, I put the uh, watermelon radishes there. Um, I never covered the watermelon radishes. I left them uncovered all season and I was, um, pulling watermelon radishes into, into January. The greens in some cases got a little bit damaged, 
but I had straw down there and, and I was able to, um, to pick watermelon radishes. My only complaint is I never plant enough because they're just so nice. Now the red, um, red leaf romaine, and I think I had some curly um, red uh, lettuce. Red lettuces do really well, especially when it's kind of hot. And, and I sort of made a makeshift shade um, cloth for that because this was um, September getting into October and I just wanted to protect it from the afternoon sun. So I just sort of did this hokey thing with the, um, with the shade fabric. What I ended up doing as we came into, um, into uh, late October, early November is I actually made a tent with my um, hoops and I covered it and it stayed well until January. And we got a six inches of snow in January. And my um, cover wasn't really taut because I kind of did it as an afterthought, not really planning on keeping the lettuce um, into the winter. And it collapsed a little bit and the cold, uh, the snow um, froze, the, froze the lettuce because it sat right on top of it when it collapsed. But I, I got that, uh, I was harvesting that from, um, I guess, September into uh, early January. So that was good. So those are my examples. So what's next? You've planted, you've decided what you want to do, you made your plan, you either bought your plants or your seed and you, and you, and you planted. So now you want to mulch to keep in the moisture and you still want to discourage any weed germination. You want to keep an eye on the temperatures um, in the fall, um, late summer into the fall, order as needed if we're not getting rain and provide some kind of shade if the temperatures are high. Um, continue to weed. Uh, you definitely want to thin as recommended on the seed packages because things like the root crops, um, it's really important no matter when you plant them. And then you'll harvest throughout the fall and the winter. And the, but the garden will swell as the days become shorter and the temperatures become lower. And so that's just sort of to be expected. But things like the half hardy and the hardy plants, they'll just pick up their growth as we um, get into the late winter and things start to warm up. Um, so that's sort of what happens. Um, as you harvest throughout the fall and the winter, if you have any cold damaged leaves, just, um, just remove them um, and the plants will be fine. And the root vegetables, even if the tops become not so pretty looking, um, the roots are fine. They're protected by the, by the soil and by whatever mulch it is that you put down. So we'll take questions. All right, we have quite a few for this one, uh, for this section. Okay. Uh, first one's on seed tape. Do you actually wet the seed? With the flower water mixture? It's getting wet as much as the, the, the flower water mixture is, is wet. It doesn't cause the seeds to like rot or anything because it, it all dries off. It, it dries out like in minutes really. I mean it, you're just putting like a little dot of, of this like kind of flower glue down. It's, it's fine. Um, yeah. Okay. I mean you can use it for any, any kind of seeds by the way but you know things like beans are easy to plant so I don't use it for anything like that. I tend to use it for things like uh, radishes, carrots, and maybe lettuce. And actually, if you go to the store, you'll see those are the kinds of things that they, they sell seed tape, but it's like $6 for six foot of seed tape. So you can buy a packet of seed for like 500 carrot seeds come in a packet for like three bucks. So, I mean, that's, that'll last you for a hundred foot of seed tape. <laughs> so you just do the math. Okay. okay. Uh, next one is on fall and winter gardening in, in containers. Do you have any particular thoughts on planting for fall and winter in pots and containers? Are there any plants that you would especially, you know, consider, uh, you know, maybe with shorter roots or that are more tolerant to drying out because of a container? I don't do a lot of container. I, well, I did, a, like, I did some lettuce in a container over this last fall. Um, I think I'd had a tomato in it and I took it out and I put some um, lettuce transplants in and they did they did fine actually they did really well the only thing was we I planted them in September and we ended up having still a pretty warm um, fall if you remember until like into like October and so they actually ended up um, bolting and going to flower so I, oh, I wow. it was a um it was a romaine type and I was I, I was harvesting the outer leaves it was like a five gallon um a five gallon bucket. And um, so I got a lot of lettuce off it, but then they actually, and, and probably they wouldn't have bolted had I managed to give them a little bit more shade, but where I had the red lettuce specifically under like a, that makeshift cover, I just planted the green lettuce. And, and I think green lettuce is a little bit more susceptible. The red just seems to be, um, red just seems to do better. I, I grew something from Johnny's that was this curly red lettuce and it made like a head of lettuce like this. And 
and I was just harvesting the outer leaves on it. And I just, I just actually harvested my last head um, about two weeks ago. So that's, that means like in July. And so I had planted it out in the, in the early spring and, and just that something about the red, the red leaves do, do really well. And I had it in a spot that wasn't even especially shaded, but it was just a really good, really good variety for, um, for, for doing well in the heat and it didn't get bitter. So that was kind of nice, but you could do, um, so you could do lettuces. Um, you could try like radishes and stuff like that. I mean, I don't know if you're, where your containers are, if they're in a place where they'll be somewhat protected, you know, like whether they're on a, you know, part of your property that's, that's kind of will stay a little bit warmer or on a balcony or something like that. But um, it's definitely worth, it's definitely worth trying. None of these things are that huge. I don't know that I would, I don't know how cold crops would be that much. They just take such a really long time and all. And, and, and you'd have like one, one broccoli in like a pot. It just, I don't know, the return on investment to me um, I'd rather have lettuces where I could pick them like kind of regularly or, or greens or kale where I could pick them kind of regularly versus like waiting for the swim broccoli plant to, to mature and, and pick when I could buy that at a store. But, you know, everybody has their, their trades that they make. So. Interesting. Very interesting. Okay. Um, we have kind of uh, two questions here, both related to carrots and soil. Um, can uh, someone be successful planting carrots, uh, root vegetables in clay soil and how deep uh, should carrots be if you have like rocky soil? I, I plant carrots in, in um, I do plant carrots in, in clay soil. I, um, but I've been working on my soil as well over time in terms of uh, using lots of compost uh, over the last few years to improve the soil and also doing cover crops. What you'll want to do if you're planting carrots is you don't want to, you don't want to plant a variety that's a, um, one of those six to eight inch roots, you know, the really beautiful ones that are this big, that's that's not what you, that's just not going to be successful um, in in the kind of soil that we have. What you want to go for the the shorter varieties like um, Little Finger is one that um, Napoli one that I showed earlier. Something that's that's probably no more than six inches is, will be better because you can definitely kind of work some compost and, and some stuff into that the top levels where the roots will go down and, and they'll be successful. If you have really rocky soil. You're going to get some interesting carrots because those are the ones where they hit a rock and then they split and they look like this, you know, or they twist around or something, but they're still edible. So it's okay. Clay soil, there's things we need to do to um, improve it. And later on in the presentation, um, uh, there's a class coming up in August that we're teaching on improving your soil. So that might be something to think about. Some folks really liked your burlap technique. Uh, they wanted to know what else you would consider putting burlap over, you know, initially to kind of keep the seeds in place. I've used it that I, you could do it on radishes, but I haven't really found radishes to be a problem. Sometimes people will put radishes in a row of, of carrots to kind of mark the row so that, you know, when the radish comes up, which the radish will come up in like five days, but the carrots might take two weeks. It sort of marks the row for you. And so I did that, but I still covered it with burlap. And then I was waiting for the carrots to, came, to come up. And when they finally came up, the radishes had so embedded themselves in the burlap, they had to really carefully um, pull it up because I was trying to make sure I disturbed the carrots, which is really what I wanted. Um, so I, I probably wouldn't do with the radishes again under the burlap, but you could do lettuces and, and, and stuff like that. Um, you do need to make sure it's, it's the um, kind of, it's, it's sort of a loose leaf burlap. Somebody gave me some um, burlap sacks from coffee beans. And I thought that would be fantastic. And I like the idea of reusing them, but they turned out not to work that well because they were really a dense um, burlap and, and there was no like little um, spaces in between the, the threads of burlap and they didn't work as well as, as this other burlap that I had found. So, I mean, you could use even some of that like black landscape fabric stuff probably too and, and pin that down. Um, it's just a way to kind of keep things so it doesn't get disturbed because sometimes we get these heavy rains where it just really, you know, pours down and we get like three inches in an hour or something. And if you just planted your, your seeds, um, they're not going to stay where they were. <laughs> so. Okay. Um, uh, also on your burlap technique, would you do shallots the same way? Um, you don't really need, you could, but you don't really need to. I mean, I would do shallots more like I do my garlic where I would cover it with a little bit of straw, I think. I'm doing it more to protect it and keep, in the, keep it in place. And, and it helps me keep it a little bit moist while I'm trying to get them to germinate. 
Uh, and last question, uh, someone has a container that they were growing tomato in, in this summer, and they're curious if they can grow garlic in that container over this winter. Yeah, I don't see why not. I assume that there haven't been any problems with diseases or anything with the tomato, and you'll definitely still want to um, add some uh, fertilizer and all. Um, if you go to something like, go to, go to Keen Garlic, K-E-E-N-E, -E -E, and they have a lot of information about um, how to prepare to, to grow garlic, garlic with more detail than we're not giving you here even. Um, so they'll talk to you about like what kind of fertilizers to use and all, and that's kind of a good resource. There's a web reference list that I gave to everybody. And at the bottom of it, one of the things that you can um, print out is one of the Virginia Tech publications on onions, garlic, and shallots, 426 to 411. So you can also look at that publication and, and, and check out the details. I, I just couldn't go into enough detail for every vegetable. All right, that's it for this round of questions. So now we're gonna transition. So we're talking about, we're trying to go from the late summer heat to the mild fall days, and then to like that real cold of winter. Well, so the picture there, I should just explain it um, on the top right. That is my cauliflower from one of the years that I grew it in the winter. I think it was one of the first times I, um, I tried to, um, to grow cauliflower. And I had beautiful plants, um, but we actually got a, a pretty um, hard frost and I'd had a row cover on it, but what I didn't realize was that cauliflower is actually pretty susceptible to, I didn't know, because I didn't know the whole hardiness thing. I was kind of just, just starting out and I hadn't really learned everything I needed to learn. And so what happens is the leaves actually um, can survive the frost, but the flower is really um, susceptible to um, the cold temperatures below um, like 32, 30 degrees. And so what I thought, I first I thought maybe that was a disease, but it turns out that it actually was um, damaged from the frost. And so I lost the actual flower. Now you can eat cauliflower flowers, but um, we tend not to because we're really growing it for the actual, actual cauliflower. So um, that was an example where I didn't actually have the right uh, protection on my plant and wasn't prepared. If you're gonna do winter gardening, you kind of want to simplify by kind of grouping your plantings together according to hardiness. Um, partially because if you do want to cover them, um, it's easier to cover like a section than to try to cover um, plants that are sort of one here and one there and, and you know, one six feet away. Um, so that's kind of handy. If you end up deciding to do any kind of, any kind of hoops or, or wire supports, um, it's nice to have plants that are sort of similar in size um, so that you can cover like the low ones with low kind of hoops and if you're, uh, or with a floating row cover where if you have something like a broccoli or a cauliflower or some kind of cold crop that's tall, you have a way to, um, cover the tall things um, similarly. So the picture there on the lower right is, is what's called a floating row cover, meaning it's just sort of floating above the plants. And it's it's mainly used for things like, like a light frost, like you hear, oh my goodness, this is gonna be a, a frost tonight. And I got some, some lettuce out there. And, and so you might be able to um, uh, put something down like that and it'll just protect it from, um, from being damaged. If you get a really heavy frost, it won't really work because where any of the leaves are touching that row cover, they'll actually be damaged. Um, so it doesn't, it doesn't work as well for that. But you can see there that they have um, cabbages and that's not actually um, protected in that picture because they didn't need to. But then you can go to things like um, coal frames and hoop houses and greenhouses. And those things will actually provide um, protection to, um, to sub-zero. So those are some things that you can, that we could, that you could do. We probably wouldn't do as sort of home gardeners, but um, commercially they do it. Um, so here's, here's a, a couple of thoughts. Um, if you provide some kind of a cover, um, a serious cover, uh, you can actually move a whole zone further south or warmer using some kind of protection strategy. So it looks really big, but the, but the, um, the greenhouse on top is just three foot by six foot. And it's got a, 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 a opening that it's just a zipper kind of thing and just some um, nice um, structure to it. And you can find those at places like an Aldi or online for anywhere from like 20 to $30. Now the thing is that's a polyethylene uh, plastic. And so the only way it vents and the only way water gets in is, is, is if you can open it or if you open it and, and water it, you know, and zip it closed again. Um, so it, it's, it's a little bit limited and it, it requires you to, it's, it's good if it's like say at your house where you can just go outside but otherwise it might require you to open it up if it gets hot or um, 
uh, you know, close it, you get over there and close it at night if it's going to get cold. Um, but it's something to do. And they, I see them a lot at the community garden by me where people use those and, and they've been um, successful with them. So that's something to think about. The lower two pictures are, are a little bit bigger, um, higher level operations, um, probably more, um, um, you know, a company or, or, a, or a, somebody that's selling stuff like at a farmer's market because they're a lot larger. But so again, floating row covers, um, they're nice actually even in the, in, the, in the spring because you can increase the germination rates because you can warm up the soil some um, and you can actually use them to defend against some kind of insects, especially if you have things that you're growing that are, um, uh, don't need pollination like beans and if you're trying to keep bean beetles away. So having covers isn't a waste. If you, it's something to invest in that you'll, you can actually use year round. So I just point that out. Um, it allows you um, at this time of year to shade the plants um, from the heat and the sun, but then later it becomes a blanket against the cold. So that's kind of handy. And if you put two layers of it down, you can get double protection. So like if it gives you four, uh, four degrees of, of um, insulation, you can actually get eight if, if you double it up. In this case, it's really um, pretty simple. They're just using bricks to kind of keep it down. So that's one simple way to do it. Otherwise, you can use things like um, PVC, um, blocks, um, reinforcing wires, you know, anything like that. I use a electrical conduit, conduit that I bend, and then I use uh, clips uh, and then landscape staples to kind of keep mine down, or sometimes I use stones. For our area, um, you can use Agrabon uh, AG19, and that's, um, that's an example of it there, and that's over um, some lettuces, and um, I think it's all lettuces in that picture there. So that provides both frost and wind protection. What's nice is any of these Agrabon products allow in um, both light and water. And so you can get 85% light transmission and you'll also get water through it. So what's nice is you can actually, when it rains, the water will go through. So unlike that polyethylene greenhouse where water won't get in like through it, it'll, it'll kind of seep in underneath through the ground if you get enough rain, these will actually let the rain in. So now in this case, um, this is showing either a nine or a 10 gauge steel wire. Um, the picture that you saw of mine was a half inch electrical conduit. And then the other thing that you can use is a half inch PVC uh, hoop. So the wire in this case actually gets stuck into the ground on either side and, and, it's, and it's, it's bendable. Um, I first got into using um, the, the fabric and the wire when I went to a, an event um, at one of the Maryland Master Gardeners um, up in, up in um, I think outside of Gaithersburg. And for $12, I got a, I got a length of fabric and four of those um, 10 gauge uh, wires. And I still use them today. Uh, probably not the same fabric, but definitely the same wires. And they're probably like eight or nine years old. So they last a long time. And then you, use, you need to use something to actually affix the fabric to either the wires or um, the hoops. And so I, uh, for, for the uh, hoops, the half inch ones, um, the binder clips or, or plastic clips work really well. For the wires, you can even use like uh, clothespins. Um, and then you need something to weigh it down because the wind will come in and it'll start to kind of uh, move it around and it won't, it won't stay down. And so you need either landscape staples, um, bricks or, or stones to, um, to keep it down so it's, it stays and provides protection. Uh, so that's pretty good there for something that's low, like lettuces that aren't too tall or arugula or something like that. Now, then you can go to the tunnel. So for something like the, the, the one in the middle, which is again, the, um, uh, the electrical conduit, what you do is you just literally push each end into the ground. And, and if your ground is good, you're gonna push it in as much as um, maybe a foot. And so if the conduit is a 10 foot conduit, you're gonna basically have eight foot of conduit showing and then a foot in the ground on either side. And so then if you get the, the row cover that's um, 10 foot wide, that works perfectly because then you have a foot on either side that can be pinned down. Here, when you buy the Agrabon, it's important to, to know that they sell it in um, like 10 foot wide by say 50 foot long. I think that's the smallest that you can get. Um, but then you can cut it up into pieces for whatever size bed or area you want to use. It's not that some of the companies sell like um, small protective kind of things that like fit over like a single plant, like gardener supply. The thing with Agrabon, when you, when you go and you look online, they're also selling to big farms, and you have to be careful because they'll sell things like um, 10 foot wide by 250 uh, feet long. You should notice that it's the wrong thing because it's really expensive. 
Um, if you get the 10 by 50 foot, it's around, I think it's like $26 these days plus shipping, something like that. Um, I like this variety and I like I, that you can find other ones on Amazon that aren't Agrabon, but they talk about protection. The only thing is that I found that they don't last as long the fabric. This stuff, even if it tears a little bit, you can use duct tape and tape it. And you should be able to get like three or four years out of it, um, which, is, which is pretty good for a $26 investment. So on the left, on the left one here where they're using a conduit, what some people do is they get um, a rebar that's maybe um, 12 or 18 inches long and they'll put the rebar in the ground and then they'll fit the, the um, PVC pipe over the rebar on either side. And that's what holds the um, PVC pipe in place. And then again, they'll use something like um, clips or, um, and they sell clips specifically for the purpose. I get these little plastic ones from the, from the dollar store and they come two in a packet and they're um, maybe um, six inches wide. And those work really good for um, what I like to do with mine. And if you look at the, on the right side, there's an example where somebody took a hose and they slid it and they cut it in six inches pieces and they use that to keep the uh, floating row cover down. So that's a really nice idea too. So small investment, um, you can use it year round in different ways. So it's something to think about. It's something that you can maybe do if you get, um, have somebody going on it with you, you can buy the fabric and, and, and split the costs. Other thing you can do is, is you can um, buy or build a, a coal frame. Um, so the example there is one that somebody um, built. You can get an old window. Um, you can get some lumber and some um, piece of hardware on their plans online that are free. And you can um, build, a, build a hinge coal frame. Um, I have one, I found, a, I found an old window. Um, I was able to get some lumber for free. And then I spent a bit more money on the hinges and I bought what's called a foundation vent that I put in the back of the coal frame. So with the top picture on the right, um, in the back of that um, in mine is about a 14 by six inch um, foundation vent. That was probably the most expensive thing. I think back then when I built it a couple, four years ago, it was, um, I think $20 or something, maybe 30. Um, I think now with, with um, cost of things going up, it's probably over 30, but um, what it does is it has a thermal couple. And so when the temperatures go below 40, it closes the vent. When the temperatures go over 70, it opens the vent. So what's nice is I don't have to worry about coming and opening my coal frame because the temperature's um, rising or falling. Um, I do need to open it sometimes to, to water, but that's fine. But you can use that to, to actually grow things in it over the winter, all winter. Um, and I've, I've started kale in it and let it winter over. And then in the early spring, I've, I've, since I didn't thin it out, I take it out then and I planted it out and, and got you know tens of plants out of it. You can also use it to harden off plants that you started indoors. You can bring them out to the garden and, and gradually get them used to um, the outdoors that way. You could force bulbs and stuff like that. But anyway, I use, I use my... Um, my coal frame in a lot of different ways. I just put stuff in it and I see what comes up and then I decide where I want to put it. I did arugula in it last year and got to put all that out and that did really well. You want to be careful with glass in the garden because you can break things. Um, mine broke. Um, I think it was actually originally had a crack in it and then that fell out and so I had to replace it. But um, that's something that you can do. And they also have kits that you can buy. And here's a bunch of different examples of coal frame. And then what some people try to do when they get really sophisticated is they try to do more to actually keep what's in their coal frame warm. In our area, we never get really that cold, but if you're in um, a northern climate where you actually um, get colder temperatures, uh, you might actually want to consider this, like in the, in the picture in the middle um, bottom, they've actually put uh, straw bells around this coal frame that they made. And um, it may even be the walls of it actually from the looks of it. And the idea is that it helps keep it warm or people put lights in their coal frame and then the heat that, uh, that comes off the lights help keep the thing warm inside. But you know, you look at the picture in the top right, there's snow on it, you have the stuff inside, the leaves of the, of the lettuces and greens look great. So here's the thing about coal frames, you don't want them to get too wet. You wanna let the soil um, dry out in them. I, I don't water mine too much after November. I sometimes go out with like a half a gallon thing of water and I water a little bit, but not too much. Just like the, your beds, you don't wanna compact the soil. Matter of fact, the soil in your coal frame should be great because the chances of you standing in your coal frame are, are kind of next to nothing. Um, if you really are worried about the cold, you could even just put a blanket or, or a, a carpet over the top of it if you are gonna have a special uh, cold snap. Uh, some people will put thermometers in to, to monitor. Like I said, I have a thermal couple in mind. So, um, 
I don't really have to monitor because it just does it for me in terms of opening and closing that vent. And that's that's been sufficient. Nothing's gotten fried in it or, or frozen. So that works out pretty well. And again, there's things you can do. Um, some people will take like jugs and um, paint them um, black and so that they warm up from the sun. And then that way the, the heat dissipates off them in the, in the evening and overnight and kind of keeps the things in there that are warm. Uh, I've also heard fresh manure under a planting bed. Um, I don't have any access to fresh manure, so I'm not going to try that. Or you could put a compost pile in there if you had a really big one. Um, and again, you can use um, soil warming cables or you can put some other kind of insulation around it. In our area here, I think that's kind of overkill for what, what we need. So I, I, I don't worry about it. But if you live up north further, um, some of those things might be important, but they might be like sort of next generation for you. OK, so we'll take questions. Okay, we just have one quick question for this section, uh, and it is: uh, Would plastic sheets or drop cloths or heavier fabric sheets be better for overwintering with PVC hoops? So, plastic sheets and drop cloths, or a heavier fabric sheet? Well, the problem with some of that is you're not going to get sun through. So, if you're using it just for um, protecting it against temperatures, because of it's sort of a point in time where it's it's going to be really cold that you're worried about, um, you could do that. But the nice thing about the commercial um, fabrics are you know that you're going to get water through them and you know you're going to get some sun through them. Um, if you go with the heavier um, versions of some of those of the Agrabon, you'll obviously, by the, by the chart I showed, you get less, less water through and less sun as, as you protect it more from the cold. But you could use those. Um, it's just that's the only thing. You want stuff to be able to get sun and water. This is one of my favorites. So this is um, cover crops. Um, so the reason I, I like cover crops is, um, and the reason I got interested in it is because around um, the Northern Virginia area, we have a, a lot of clay in our soil. And it's, it's just really hard to um, put enough in the soil to um, improve it with, with buying, buying soil and, and buying, um, you know, compost. There's other things that you need to do, especially if you want to get down deeper in the soil. And the other thing is you have an opportunity with cover crops to actually uh, revitalize the soil by capturing some minerals like nitrogen um, through growing certain kinds of plants like uh, legumes. Um, so when I first heard about it and I knew that I had this soil that clearly had a lot of clay in it, I was very much interested in, in exploring what I could do with cover crops. The other thing is I really don't like weeding and so the nice thing to me about cover crops is it actually suppresses um, the growth of all those weeds that can um, like start to, to lay down roots in the winter and then in the early spring just sort of take over a garden. And I see a lot of those in the community garden. So to me, it's a chance to um, improve the soil, reduce some of the compaction of the soil. And I think it's worth doing even in, even in small gardens. So here's some of the candidates. Um, is annual rye. Um, I, I, I'd usually, I've done winter rye on that list. I've done oats. I've done um, crimson clover. I've done some tillage radish. And uh, I've done buckwheat, which is really more of a spring summer um, uh, cover crop. So the winter rye and the clovers in our area, they're pretty frost tolerant and they'll survive um, the winter, which is good because I want them to grow and, and, and get good roots and get lots of green growth. Clover is a legume, so it's also a nitrogen fixer. And so that's good because it helps um, restore nitrogen to the soil, especially where I've had uh, heavy feeders like tomatoes and, and peppers and such. And then winter rye is nice because it has this really deep root system that will help break up the soil. And, and, and what you're doing is you're leaving the roots in the soil when you actually um, cut the, the rye down. And those roots decay pretty quickly, but they add organic matter to the soil and, and like many inches down. So that's really helpful. Um, and the same with buckwheat and oats, but um, those are um, not really frost tolerant, but uh, I've used uh, oats a couple years, like in this case, in this picture, it's clover and um, oats. And so apparently in, in winter of 2020, it didn't get cold enough because the clover is actually supposed to die back, but it didn't. So in that case, I had to cut the clover down. Um, but there's a publication there um, from Virginia Tech that, that goes into some of the um, cover crops and building healthy soil. But here's some details on the, on the cover crop. So it's interesting, um, what's important is if you look at the, the column where it says amount to sow um, for 100 square foot, it, it gives you a quantity in ounces. If you look at crimson clover 
And if you want to plant crimson clover for 100 square feet, so that's say um, 10 by 10 foot, right? Or um, what, three by 30. So that's a, that's a pretty big three foot bed. Um, you're gonna you're gonna need a third of an ounce. Well, they tend to sell it in um, quantities of, of like quarter pounds to pounds. So like something like um, rye, you need three and a half um, ounces for 100 square feet. So that's about a pound for say like a, a 400 square foot garden uh, where the clover is, um, you know, for, for a 400 square foot garden, you're gonna do like an ounce. Um, so I point that out because when you go to some of these websites and look, it, you need to kind of know what square footage you have and, um, and sort of plan accordingly. Otherwise you could end up with a lot of uh, seed that you don't need. But it's a perfect thing to share with somebody. And it, if you buy seed for one year, um, it'll last um, for a couple of years after that, it'll still be good. So you could buy seed, like say this year, and then use some of it this year and use some of it in the, in the next two years as well. Um, so I, I buy um, clover and I, I typically um, share it or I just reuse it again. But you just, you just kind of want to know, like, especially because clover is so different than rye. And, and clover is a small seed, looks a lot like a, um, like a radish seed where when or why it looks like rice, just like you, sort of like what you would think. Um, but that goes into a lot more detail, this chart about what some of the advantages are of, of using some of these things. So what you wanna decide on is what you'd like to accomplish. Are you just trying to improve heavy clay soil or did you just have some, um, you know, some heavy feeders and you wanna replace the nitrogen over, over the winter and maybe add some organic matter. And so that would sort of help drive what cover crop you wanna try. The other thing is when I show you the winter, the uh, winter rye example, you'll see that if you want, you can even grow like basically your own straw that then you could use as a mulch in your garden. So uh, rye is kind of a like a, a twofer there. So that's kind of nice. But you definitely want to figure out what you might want to try and then determine what size of the planting area is that you have in square feet and then calculate the amount of cover crop needed. But same like you would do for any planting, you want to clean up the, the, the um, plant debris, aerate it a little bit, add some compost. And then you can either um, plant rows or you can sprinkle the seed evenly over the area and then just cover it lightly. Or you can work it in gently, like sometimes I'll use just sort of a rake and kind of work it in. Uh, it tends to need to be like a quarter inch or a half inch deep at least. And then you water it. And then I like to put a, a, a light a layer of mulch over it. Often I'll use um, straw or leaf mulch just to kind of protect it um, while I'm waiting for it to germinate. Typically, you would plant it in October, late October. I planted it as late as um, uh, November. Only problem with that for me is in the community garden, they shut the water off um, around the first frost. And so if I plant it too late and we don't get any rain, I don't have a way to water it. And so that can be a problem. Uh, but here's my, um, my example of, of rye. The top left picture, I planted it in November 11th one year and I covered it with straw. About a month later, that's what it looks like. So it looks like kind of grass. And, in this case, I planted my entire garden in rye. So the lesson learned here is that you can't cut rye down until it's ready. And rye is never ready in our area until the end of April, early May. So what happens is you can't really do anything of an early spring garden if you plant every single bed in rye. But I didn't know that. But so that's what I got. And I got Beautiful rye came um, St. Patty's Day, so um, we got snow, but the rye is, is still there. It's doing fine. It's, it's only just a little bit bigger. You think, wow, I don't know what's going on here. And then you get to the 18th and you just look a month later, look at how much growth it's gotten. It's, it's twice as big. And then a couple of weeks later, I mean, it's like three, four foot high and it's ready to cut down. And the reason, the way I know it's ready to cut down is it's got pollen on the seed heads. The first thing that happens is you get these seed heads and you can see that in the top, um, in the top left picture. And then if you look in the bottom left picture, when the seed heads start getting the pollen on it like that, that means that the, the, the plant is, is, has gone through its life cycle and it's ready to be cut down. If you try to cut it down sooner, it, sometimes it can come back a little bit. But what you do is you cut it right down at the, at the soil surface. Um, and then you, you have all these stalks and you can see that in the middle picture. And I just use um, a pair of um, manual hedge trimmers, the kind you know with the 12 inch blades, or I sometimes just grab it and I use scissors and I just like work my way down the row. And 
And then what I do is I leave those stalks in the path or on top and I just let them start to dry out. Um, if I wanna plant um, like say tomatoes or peppers or something, I give it a few days and then what I'll do is I'll go in and I'll dig holes where the roots are, are kind of still there and I'll put some compost there too and, and whatever the fertilizers were I was gonna use. And then I just put the plants in right there, but I don't, don't worry about the roots. You, remember, you can't really take the roots out. Like if that's what you thought you were gonna do, it's, that's not how it works. What you do is you leave them and they decompose and they're improving the soil and they're um, aerating it and they're um, um, improving like the just water and everything, the water flow through the soil, um, through the clay. So it works out really well. I did try to um, clear one bed because here, I, like I told you, I had done the whole garden in, um, in, in that. And so you can see that lower picture in the lower left of that picture where there's like a clear bed and I planted some stuff. Well, it was backbreaking work to try to pull out that rye because I wanted one bed where I could plant, I think, some lettuces or root vegetables. And um, I, that's how I learned never to do that. What you need to do is leave the beds free that you're going to want to plant early. But for, for beds like squash and eggplant and tomatoes and peppers, generally around here, you don't plant that much before May anyway, so it's, it's fine. But now that stuff will dry out and I can cut it in half a little bit more and then I can, I can chop it up and then I can use it actually on my beds as, as, a, as a mulch. So my lessons learned, it's, it's, it's a, I think it's easy. It's fairly inexpensive. It's around $10 to plant like a 20 by 20 plot bed. It's, it's I don't know, about a pound or so that you need. Um, don't sow rye in the areas that you want to do early spring planting because literally you, I've never been able to cut it down before the beginning of May, uh, late April. And again, the bonus is you get to use that dried rye. So you can see in that picture where I'm using the rye around my plants to um, keep the moisture in and keep the weeds down. And the thing is that you really don't get any weeds in those areas where you have that, um, those cover crops. And that picture I showed earlier with the crimson and clover, when clover gets those pretty flowers, that's when you cut it down because again, it's gone through its life. And so you cut that down to the ground and uh, don't pull it out. And then what you can do is chop that up and a little bit turn it under and, and that plant has nitrogen all throughout it and that nitrogen will go back into the soil. And so it's available for the um, plants that you're gonna put in there. All right, so questions on that and then we're gonna go into the last bit. Yep, just a few quick questions. Um, so when do we plant cover crops? Uh, the chart said to plant many of them in the fall, but that's when we have oftentimes vegetables in our beds. Well, it depends on, um, that's why I said sometimes I don't get mine until November. Um, that's where you make your decision about, am I gonna, if you're, if you're doing fall or winter planting, you're not gonna put cover crops um, um, in those beds. So those beds would be beds that you'd leave free to plant fall, winter stuff, and then probably early spring stuff. If you, um, uh, at some point you're gonna have to take out the, um, the, you know, the peppers and stuff that's sort of starting to get spent. Um, if, it's, if they're really going bang, gangbusters, you may just wait and do like I do and like, like the very early part of November, try to get your cover crop in. Um, but that's sort of a crossover decision that you have to make sort of a lot of times in the garden, right? Where something's looking really good, where it's, it's not good, but you keep hoping you'll get a little bit more out of it and you're just gonna have to make the decision. Um, you could plant it as early as, as um, early October actually, if you want, but I, I never actually get mine in that early because I'm always still, nursing along my um, tomatoes and peppers and my mid -sum, you know, my summer crops. So. Okay, so to that, I guess to that point, can we, do you have to make the decision between vegetables and cover crops? You know, for those of us with a smaller garden, um, an individual has a four by eight bed who asked a question earlier, like, can you do a cover crop on a side and then continue to still plant vegetables next to it? Sure, I mean, you can, you can, you can take a bed and do part of it in cover crop. I mean, you could do like a strip of cover crop along the length of the bed, or you could do um, half of the bed. Once they really get going, they tend to get big and they sort of spread out. Come spring, that, that um, rye that you planted, say, along the edge will, will at least take up a foot, you know, along, along the length of it. But it'll just provide roots in sort of that area of it. And then you'll have some of the straw that you can use. You know, if you do something similar next year, you'll over time rehabilitate that bed and, and improve it. The last question uh, is, can you, can you mix cover crops? They have different advantages. Can you, can you interplant them? <clears throat> you can. And actually, if you go to, um, 
you go to Johnny's, you can um, buy mixes um, or you can buy two varieties, like say the clover and the rye and, and mix them. Like I've mixed the, I mixed the oats and crimson clover one year. And that's why that, that there was that picture where I mixed them. Um, the reason I don't buy Johnny's mixes is one of the, one of the um, components of his, of their, mix, their mixes is usually hairy vetch. And I haven't wanted to use hairy vetch because I've heard that it can be, um, it can become a little bit um, invasive and hard to get rid of. And so I just sort of have wanted to stay with the ones that I was comfortable with. And so I haven't, I haven't tried to use that one. We actually do have another question, and this is kind of uh, two people have asked this almost indirectly, but it seems like folks are challenged with like deciding like why would you plant spring and summer vegetable beds with cover crops rather than than fall and winter? Well, like I said, the year I planted all the all the cover crop, um, I regretted it because I didn't allow any space for spring vegetables. Um, and what I ended up doing that year was I pulled out, some of the cover crop in one area. And then, and, and what I also did that year was the cover, where the cover crop didn't take, um, I had like some little spots. I put like lettuce plants in and a couple of spots like that. I really needed to improve my soil. So in that case, I wasn't really into that much of, of winter growing anyway. So I wasn't giving up a lot. It depends on what your soil is like. If your soil needs um, help because it's heavy in clay, you may want to choose a better to to um, to invest the time in to do the cover crop, and then that way the next year maybe that bed will be better and well it'll be definitely better for the summer and then and then that next year and then maybe switch. Now I have a twenty by twenty foot garden, so I have four or five beds, so I can kind of say I'm going to do two beds and cover crop this year and and two not, and partly because I want some of that straw. Um, but if you have a, only one bed and it's three by eight, you may not bother with cover crop. And if you have good soil, you know, don't. If you plant it nicely enough with the with the um, with your fall crops, you're not going to worry about weeds because you're planting something in it. You're not whatever you do, don't leave it don't leave it bare. Whatever you do, don't leave a don't leave a garden bed bare over the winter because um, it's just going to be problematic in the spring. I mean, cover it with mulch, grow something in it grow a cover crop. If you don't want to do any kind of um, fall or winter gardening, at least put your garden to bed. So clean up all the debris, get rid of any, um, any disease material. This kind of feeds into that question. Add some compost now to um, give it time to enrich your soil over the winter. I tend to put compost down in my garden in the fall and I put compost down in, in the winter again as well. And add anything you can that's disease-free and insect-free, um, dig it into the soil or um, Add to the compost bin. Like when I when I dig up my sweet potatoes, I actually cut up the sweet potato vines and just and just till it under and let it decompose over the over the winter. What else can you do if you have perennials, flowers, um, or plants um, like asparagus or something? Cut them back and mulch. Again, we if you haven't done a soil test, consider that. Definitely mulch um, with something like straw or a leaf mulch just to control the weeds and, and um, it'll break down over time and add some organic matter and, and it'll help you with warming the soil in the spring. Um, clean up your tools. Um, it's, um, I think, a, a, one, of the, um, one of the resources is, is tool care. And then start planning for next year. There is this class coming up, Feed Your Soil to Feed Your Plants on August 19th um, that you can sign up for on our website. And there's actually a recorded class on putting your garden to bed that gets into, I think, even a little bit more detail than, what's, than what I've just mentioned here. So you might consider that. Um, and then start to think about spring and finding out for those seed catalogs and um, think about charting your garden and crop rotation. Um, but in terms of fall and winter gardening, um, you know, start small, plant some garlic, uh, plant some lettuce or spinach or maybe some watermelon radishes. Arugula is one of my absolute favorites. It's, it's really hardy. You don't necessarily have to cover it um, at all. Um, kale, you definitely um, don't have to cover it. It just um, might start to look a little ragged and then it'll come back in the spring, but you'll definitely get to harvest um, um, in the fall through probably December if you plant some of that, either by seed or by transplant. Um, look for spots where maybe you have shade because of trees, but they now are going to lose their leaves. And so maybe that gives you a sunny winter spot. And think about growing something there. How about some Swiss chard? It looks pretty nice, actually, in the garden. It's, it's actually um, kind of decorative. 
at the very least, you can use a sheet to protect the crops from like a light frost just to keep them going. That's a quick thing. Think about one of those mini greenhouses. And again, think about a cold frame. But again, these things aren't really necessary. Um, just try to grow some plants and, and get some uh, production through the, through the uh, end of the year. And that'll be kind of fun. Think this idea of continuous gardening. You can plant garlic now. You can then, when the garlic comes out at the end of June, you could think about cucumbers and then maybe you would do a cover crop like something like an oats or a clover um, combo in, in September or October, where you can go from peas to squash to kale. And so then kale would be your, um, your, fall, um, your fall crop. Or you could have lettuce and then go to broccoli um, up, coming up. Or you can do uh, rye. So you do radishes, greens, and rye. Or So, so here's just some ideas of, of sort of a progression. Um, but you don't have to do it all. Pick one thing and just try it and see if you have fun with it and you like it. If it's if it's too much, stick with your um, stick with your summer gardening and 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 you know be happy for that. One thing I'll say about cover crops is if you do them, it's kind of like you do it and forget it until the until the spring. Um, so that's kind of a nice thing if you want to just do something to help your garden and you're not really into doing early spring gardening and and you just you kind of just want to make it. It actually makes it easy for you come um, come spring. And the rest of these slides are just um, reference slides. Um, talks a little bit about Virginia um, Cooperative Extension. If you have any questions, um, besides the references, you can uh, email our help desk and they'll answer it um, pretty quickly. Um, we have a whole lot of classes still in the virtual classroom, so you can check that out. And then we actually have demonstration gardens in the area. And so we have um, one vegetable garden that you can go and visit um, that's operating from now into the fall. So if you live in this area, I highly recommend going there. It's really fun. Um, here's the schedule. So what we're talking about right now, um, we're in uh, July, August, we're, we're, we're nurturing, we're harvesting, um, but we're also in August starting to think about these cool weather crops. Um, and then in, as we get into the fall, we're gonna take care of those things if we planted them and maybe plant the cover crops would be the sort of the, um, the, the nominal schedule for this is for zone seven, seven A and B. And then here's some of the things that, um, that we, that really just a summary of some of the things that we've talked about here. And then lastly, um, I love the between the rows. Um, if you go to this link, it'll tell you things that you should do for each month in your, in your vegetable garden. And it's really well done. So I highly recommend that. They've, they've revised that and made it really, uh, really, really helpful. And then there's a whole lot of more vegetable gardening resources besides the ones that we've sent you. And again, lots of classes. And so if you're outside the area, um, here's a link to find your own cooperative extension office. If you're not sure what plant hardiness zone you're in, if you go to that link there, you can put in your zip code and it'll help uh, tell you what your hardiness zone is and what your last frost date and first frost dates are. And then the link at the bottom, um, it has a lot of different um, uh, interesting maps I like. Um, that talk about just climate changes and you know climate issues and, and gardening maps and all. So I highly recommend those if you're outside our area and, and, and not, not close enough to zone seven. And that's it. And I would guess there's no more questions. Yep, we don't have any questions, just a lot of thanks uh, in the mm -hmm. chat. So um, I appreciate everyone's patience uh, for us going a little bit over today. Um, thank you, Dona, for the wonderful presentation. Okay. Uh, and thanks, Julie, for all the help with the chat. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Julie.